All right, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Numbers. And uh, let's go to uh, Numbers and chapter 14. You remain standing, it'd be great <clears throat> if you're comfortable doing that. And uh, let's start off in Numbers uh, uh, 14. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start at uh, uh, verse uh, 36. And uh, read through a little while here. Uh, Numbers 14. I want to talk, uh, go not up, for the Lord is not among you. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you. Or don't go to battle without God. And uh, let's uh, start at verse 36. It says, And the men which Moses sent to search the land, uh, who returned, and made all the congregation a murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report unto, uh, upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jep Jephthah, uh, which were of the men that went to search out the land, live still. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up unto the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and will go up unto a place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, uh, that ye be not uh, smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not uh, be with you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the chance to preach the word, and I pray tonight that we would uh, make sure that we fight this battle right, Lord. It's so important we understand this is a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, as you blessed us this morning with the peace of God and your presence and uh, your word, I pray tonight again you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, this message is for a purpose. I pray that you'd help us to see how what we should do. If we're about to make this mistake, may we not do it. I pray each one of us would understand the most important things in, in, in this battle and uh, just to draw near to you. May I not say anything you don't once said, and may you be glorified. May your people be helped. May you uh, impact lives in a powerful way. And we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the, for the, the chance to hear it and for your people gathered together. Uh, we claim your promise where two or three are gathered uh, in your name. You're in the midst of them. We claim that promise, and we've gathered in your name, in the name of Jesus. And that's also whose name we pray in. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, Israel had, uh, this is a <clears throat> very interesting story. I've uh, one of my uh, most interesting stories in the Bible to me and one of my favorite stories to preach on. In chapter 13, uh, they came to, uh, they came out of Egypt, they went to the, to the Mount of God, and then they traveled north, and they went up to the precipice from the south um, up toward uh, uh, the uh, Promised Land, and uh, they were in a place called Kadesh or Kadesh Barnea, and they're right on the border of Canaan land, and, uh, and they sent uh, the 12 spies out, and the 12 spies went in, and they toured the, the promised land, and they brought back some samples, the, the figs and the grapes. I mean, the club, one cluster of grapes took two men and a pole to carry. It was so big, and, uh, and uh, it was uh, a very, uh, very fruitful land, but also they saw giants. They saw, wild, they saw walled cities, and they saw enemies, and uh, they saw both. And uh, just so you remember this, is usually the greatest blessing are the biggest giants. And uh, that's the way life works. And if you want to go to great things, you got to fight great battles. And uh, and uh, there there is uh, there is some uh, fine desert land where uh, you're not going to get attacked, and where it's easy to uh, not uh, do anything for God. But if you want to do anything for the Lord, uh, there's usually uh, battles. And God let them see both things, and uh, both the uh, giants and the blessings. Um, ten spies. Um, said, uh, we can't go in. There's no way we can overcome them. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, let's go in at once, for we're well able to overcome them. And, uh, <clears throat> and those ten spies, they, they, they not only just said, oh, man, I'm worried about this, but they, they did some things. They went and exaggerated things. And, and they began to tear apart what the land really was and lie about the land. You said uh, um, in verse 36, and God says it a couple times, and God kind of repeats himself. You know, the Bible's a big book, and, uh, but it, it's, it's still big enough to carry and read. When God repeats things, it's pretty important, and because uh, he takes the time to tell us it again, saying it once is enough, but it's emphasis. 
And uh, verse 36, the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation a murmur against the against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. For even those men which had bring up the evil report upon the land <clears throat> died by the plagues for the Lord. Now understand here, this is real important here. The land was incredibly fruitful. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. They did bring back and showed everybody the grapes of Eskel, but they went and slandered the land. If you, if you look back at what they said in chapter 13, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, <clears throat> verse 32, it says, and the, they brought back an evil report of the land which they searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we had gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw were men of great stature. A couple things. There were giants in the land. They said all the people we saw were of great stature. stature. Not true. Almost none of them were. Okay, uh, most of the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Jebusites, the Amorites, most of them. Uh, one family of one nation out of all those nations was giants, the children of Anak. But they said all of them are giants. And then they said, we're on their side as grasshoppers. That was also an exaggeration. They said, the land's a land that eats up the inhabitants. No, the inhabitants were healthy and the land was flowing with milk and honey. God told them you're going to inherit great uh, farms and great orchards and great vineyards. But, but they, they brought back an evil report. Can I say, when God has been good and God is blessed and you slander it, it's very insulting to God. If you ever done something like that, if you ever if you ever had somebody change the report, if you did something well or you did something good and somebody lied about it and somebody says it's bad, it's very insulting. God planned this land especially for them. He'd been promising to them for a thousand years. He made it a fruitful and blessed land. And he says, I can't wait to see it. Go check it out. And God let them see grape clusters this big. That's not a, a land that's drying and eating everybody up. That is the land that everybody's eating up, okay? But, uh, but that's the way it does. And <clears throat> I'm going to say it's really, really important in the spiritual realm. When you are rebelling, when you're rebelling, your mind can make up anything. <laughs> you can, look, if uh, somebody, somebody doesn't want to go to church, they start saying, all churches do is talk about money and gossip about each other. Oh, that's all they do. And then you were at church and said, everybody at church talked about me. Everybody did bad things to me. They all hated my God. And you're going, uh, I was there and really actually they didn't. <laughs> you can make up all kinds of things when you're rebellious. And you can convince yourself all kinds of things that aren't true. Uh, and, 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 and you can do that. And you got to be very careful about that because the, uh, the rebelling mind is crazy. You can have great parents and think they're the worst parents in the whole world. You can have, uh, you can have great uh, uh, uh a uh, great church or a great family or, or, or a great job. When you decide to rebel, you will see only the bad. And the bad, you saw a couple giants, everybody's a giant. Everybody hates me. Every, you just, the devil makes you go to La La Land. And you don't think, and, it's, and it's, I, I've sat there and, um, and tried to grab people doing this in the rebellion and say, you've got it good, what are you talking about? No, this isn't true. Logic, think, snap out of it. And they just know, no, everything's wrong. Everybody hates me. Everything's wrong. Uh, and, and you can't tell them, no, that person's been pretty good to you. Your life's not that bad. <laughs> and it's very difficult when the rebellious mind wants to find wrong, they will find wrong. They, 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 they will be so angry. Well, you, I might have a $5,000 bed, but you know what? I want an air mattress. I didn't want this. They, you, know, they, they, you can always find something wrong. You can always find something wrong with your nation. You can find something wrong with your family. You can find something wrong with your house. You can find something wrong with your, with your neighbor. You can find something with your job. When you want to rebel, when you, your church, you can find something wrong with your church. And if you want to rebel, you will take every little thing and make it a giant. Because, because that's what you do. And you will think that you're the worst people around you. When you're away from the Lord, <clears throat> and uh, you are far from victory, no matter how close it looks, they were very near. 
Understand, they get a cross right in. They were very near, but they rebelled and said, God can't bring us in here. He's, he's brought us out here to kill us in the wilderness. And this land's terrible. And the people said, let's go back to Egypt. And God had just brought us out here to die. And Moses is terrible. And God said, all right, fine. You're not going in. You don't want to go in? I'm not sending you in. And in the typical way, <laughs> this is not funny, except for I laugh at everything. In the typical way of people being foolish, here they are on the border. God says, I'm going to send bees before you. I'm going, to, I'm going to weaken your enemies. I'm going to make the walls fall down of Jericho. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you victory. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to make you win this battle. You many times won't even have to fight. I will just defeat them. And they go up there and say, we can't go in. It's a terrible land. And God's going to kill us. And we, we just go back to Egypt. And then God says, all right, you're not going in. Except for Joshua and Caleb. You rebelled. You, you, you slandered this. You said, you don't believe me after all my miracles I did for you. You're not going in. And they said, we want to go in. We want to go in. We want to go in. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. And they said, we're going in whether you want us to or not, Moses. And God says, and Moses says, don't go in. God's not with you. It's an amazing thing. They were just screaming and yelling, let's go back to Egypt. God says, okay, you can't go in. No, we want to go in called rebellion. And rebellion is stupid and makes you, your IQ drops about a hundred points when you rebel. Okay. It is amazing. And, and you will always rebel, rebel against everything. It's almost humorous that you can go to a rebel and say, don't you ever come to church again? Oh yeah, I'm coming. That's just the way, it just, it's just the way it works. Um, because they're rebellious and 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 uh, it's very funny and, uh, and, uh, and 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 it's very sad but it's very funny if you have a sense of humor like mine that laughs at everything and uh, and, uh, and 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 there you go they were right there they were right there but when you think you're real close to getting everything you want and you don't have God with you you're very far from victory I just want to give you some thoughts on this about them not going up because they tried to go in. Moses didn't lead them. They tried to go in. They tried to march into the promised land because they're right on the border. They tried to march in and they were soundly defeated. I want to give you some thoughts on this. Number one, <clears throat> there is great account of, where there is great accountability. Let me re read that again. There is great accountability where there is great blessings. There is great accountability where there is great blessings. Chapter 14. And verse 22, because these men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not, uh, and have not hearkened unto my voice, surely they shall uh, not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. You know, he says, they, these people saw me part the Red Sea. They saw me do the Passover, and they saw me save their children. They saw me give them everything to the Egyptians and set them free. They saw me uh, rain food down from heaven. They saw me uh, send a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. They saw all that, and they still don't believe, and they don't want to go in. That is a point that God brought up because they have seen my works, and they're still doing this. Because we're great blessings are where God, you've seen God work, where God has been good to you and spoken to you. God expects you to have faith and obey and be thankful. It says it powerfully in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12. And this is such an important concept to understand. If, if God has been really good to you, you need to say, wow, I have a great deal of accountability to do more than everybody else, to have more faith. God has shown himself to me. God's blessed me. God gave me great mercy, but I didn't deserve it. God revealed himself to me. I better do the right thing. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Luke chapter Luke chapter 14, and uh, Luke chapter 14, thinks at 12, and... Uh, <clears throat> And uh, let's see. <clears throat> I'm not fine. Uh, Luke 14. I don't have the right verse written down. And uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. And uh, where it says this. Too much is given, uh, much is required. Somebody see it in here? And uh, 
I got the wrong reference written down. And uh, so, but it's in, <laughs> it's in there. Oh, Luke, uh, let me try it again. Luke 12. I told you Luke 12. Why'd you tell me it was Luke 14? <clears throat> Luke 12 and verse 48. But he knew not and, <clears throat> and uh, did commit th uh, things uh, worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For to whomsoever much is given, to him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed uh, much, of him will they ask the more. Great blessings and great miracles and great blessings on your life and God working brings great expectations from God and great accountability. They should have repented. They should have obeyed. They should have done those things. There is great accountability with great blessings. Number two, don't think you can be foolish or sinful, then just manipulate things. <laughs> don't think you can be foolish and sinful, then think you can just manipulate things. Now let's go back to Numbers and chapter 14 <clears throat> and verse, uh, Numbers 14 and verse 40. Then they rose up early in the morning and got them up to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here and will go up unto the place which the Lord had promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore, now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Go on it up, for the Lord is not among you, uh, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. Um, but verse 44, uh, But they presumed or, to go up into the, under the hilltop. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord uh, uh, and Moses departed not out of the camp. And when the Amalekites came down uh, and the Canaanites, which dwell on that hill, smote them and discomforted them even unto Horma. Um, it's the thing people do. They think they're going to do wrong, and they think they're going to, but they're, they're talented, and they're gifted, and they're clever. And they're going manipulate, to manipulate their way out of their mistakes and their wrongs. And they're going to make it be okay anyway, because they got a great plan. Can I tell you, just because you're clever does not mean you can sneak around God. <laughs> Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And understand that just because you think you can, you, you, you can just work your way into the blessings, even though you're just kind of rebelling and doing the wrong thing, and you think, well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to presume that this is going to work anyway. <clears throat> Don't do that. That's a very foolish thing to do. This is something very, very common in talented people. You know, it's, it's a sad thing to me oftentimes to see people with these, these, these two points, gifted people many times, who are very talented and can always, always seem to be able to land on their feet and stuff like that. They try that in the spiritual realm. And maybe they can do that with their finances. Maybe they can do that, and they did it in the past, and they weren't saved. And maybe they could do it, you know, with their, with their gifts and with people. They can charm people back even though they did foolish things. But what I'm going to tell you, p talented people I see oftentimes continue to fall and fall and fall because they always think they can talk their way out of it or work their way out of it or plan their way out of it or clever their way out of it. They don't realize that, look, you're fighting in a different realm now. And you got to do the right thing and expect to reap good instead of doing the wrong thing except expect to re reap good. And do not think that you can just manipulate your way out of it. Saul tried that. Saul tried to obey God his way. And Saul said, I'll, I'll, I'll sacrifice what I want to sacrifice. We don't want to sacrifice them. I will obey what I want to obey, and I'll just make up my own rules to serve God, and I'll do it my way. Cain tried that. I'll give God my kind of sacrifice, and he will accept it. And, and you understand, you can't just manipulate blessings. You earn them. You do the right thing. And don't think, well, we're so close. We'll just, we'll just presume to go up there. We're right here. God brought us this far. We'll just, it's right there. Come on. God said he'd help us to conquer them. And they just start making up their justifications. They go over the hill and they get smashed. Don't try to manipulate things. <clears throat> don't think that you can make foolish and sinful uh, decisions and then just manipulate things and make them work out blessed. Number three, fighting a spiritual battle without God's help is hopeless. It's hopeless. We read these verses. They got destroyed. Verses 41 through 44 and 45, they're defeated. The Amalekites came down and the Canaanites. But look how many times Moses warned them. <clears throat> 
Verse 41, it shall, uh, and Moses said, and Moses uh, said, wherefore do you now transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you. You'll be smitten before your enemies. Verse 43, because you have turned away from the Lord, therefore the Lord will not be with you. They were warned this stuff. And you know, you're, God's not with you, and you'll need God to win this battle. And they presumed to go up anyway. And they did that. Of course, they were defeated. And you see that. See, the important thing is the Lord must be with you. Verse 42, for the Lord is not among you. And he says that over and over. The Lord's not with you. This is not of God. You're doing this on your own without God's planning. God's not going to help you. God's not going to bless you. And here's the problem. <clears throat> is there is a devil out there that seeks to kill, still kill and destroy. And you go out of the shelter of the will of God for your life. And God's got protection and blessing. And God's going with you. And you all of a sudden wing out over here. You just left without God. And now you're not underneath the protection of God from the devil. And he is so much more powerful than you. He's powerful in every way. He's smarter than you. He knows the scripture better than you. He has more physical strength than you. He has everything on you. The only reason you can fight the devil is because God helps you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It doesn't say you are greater than the devil. The Bible didn't never say that. You aren't. <laughs> okay? It's a spiritual war. Can I tell you, when God's with you, it's such a beautiful thing to go to victory. Without God, trying to fight in a spiritual realm is to guarantee defeat and mess up and discouragement. You need God. It's good. Look at, look at the difference here. Let's get Exodus 33. <clears throat> it's, it's, it, the Lord must be with you. And the difference between them trying to do it themselves and failing and God being with you and helping you is everything. God promised he'd go with them and they would get victory. In Exodus 33 and verse 14, and he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. Look, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you. What a comfort that is. I'm going to just go forward and give you a, a good pile of verses about God being with you and, and you following God's plans for your life and for his will for your life, and see how he goes with you and gives you the victory. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5, There shall not a man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. The comfort, the peace from having God with you, and being with and God with you in this spiritual battle, it is everything having God with you. Let's go to Isaiah. So don't make your secular plans without God. Don't, don't mess around and think just because you're clever, you're going to outsmart the devil. You need God with you. <clears throat> Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Just, I'm just even the beauty of when God is with you, how secure you are and how the victory's there. But without God, you're nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Isaiah 41, in the beautiful verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Verse 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. See how beautiful the promises are when God's with you? And God gave the same thing to Israel, but they tried to go without God. Isaiah 43 and verse 1 and 2. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, it shall not, uh, uh, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. When God is with you, the, 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 the victory and the safety and the protection you have with God. Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? The presence of God. But do not ever presume to think you could fight in this spiritual war in your own power. <clears throat> Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. But they did it. And they were warned, don't go up there. God's not with you. The Ark of the Covenant is staying here, and God's not in this plan. <laughs> You're the same people who just rebelled. And by the way, can I tell you this? They said the words, we have sinned, but they weren't repentant in obedience. 
obedient. Let me go back to that in a minute here. Let me take you to Ephesians 6. <clears throat> this is a spiritual war, not a physical war, and you've got to have God's presence with you. Your life is a spiritual war from start to finish. You're serving the Lord, the devil's fighting you, and God's got a plan for your life. Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. It is a spiritual war, and you need the Lord with you and his weapons. And 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, it's a spiritual war. For though we, this is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not physical, they're not fleshly, but mighty, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing to captivity every thought the obedience of Christ. He says, look, this, is, this warfare is not in the flesh. It's not because you have a strong willpower, or you're, or you're buff, or you're tough, or you're whatever. It is not a physical war. A little 80-pound widow could be a mighty warrior in God's sight, and a 300-pound and a, and a uh, hulk could be a wimp spiritually. Because it's a spiritual war. And do not presume you can fight the devil and win this war in your own strength. You need God to be with you. And they went up without God and tried to fight that battle. Let's go back to Numbers 14. <clears throat> go not up because the Lord's not among you. You're not going to go fight this battle. The, the, these people are more mighty, mightier than you. These, this, this is a country prepared for war. You're not prepared for war. But I was going to give you the victory. I was going to go with you. But you did not trust me or obey me. And you expected to do wrong and have right. And then when I told you you can't go in, you decided to go in without me. Because, can I tell you? <laughs> it's, 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 something is so true I found in life. Bad decisions beget bad decisions. Most people make one bad decision, they make a second bad decision to, to, to add to it. They think they're going to cover it with a bad decision. And they just keep making bad decisions, bad decisions, and bad decisions make bad decisions. Somewhere you have to stop and say, okay, I made a bad decision. I'm cutting my losses here. I'm telling the truth. I'm breaking off this relationship. I'm fixing this thing. Because bad decisions tend to make bad decisions. And the decision to rebel and not go in uh, led them to make the bad decision to try to go in without God. Because bad decisions make bad decisions. And they go and they say in verse 40, it says, And when they rose up early in the morning, got them up to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here and we will go up. We're right here under the place which the Lord hath promised. Notice that. Here's what really caught my attention is they said, God promised us this thing. You go, God promised it to Israel, not to you individuals. He's going to send Joshua and Caleb and a whole new generation, your children are going to go in, but you're not going in. He promised it to the nation, they can wait. He promised it to Abraham, but you guys are down in Egypt for a while. It's an everlasting habitation for you as a nation. But they said, we, we deserve it. We're entitled to this land. And God said, no, you're not. They presumed upon God. And then they said, yeah, for we have sinned. <clears throat> we're right here, though, so we're going to go in. I want to say, <laughs> there is a time when you want something from God where you will kind of say, okay, yeah, I sinned. Okay, fine. Anyway, can I have what I wanted? Kids do that often. All right, no ice cream. What do you mean no ice cream? You did something wrong. Okay, I'm sorry. Can I have my ice cream now? And you know, we parents are going to eat the ice cream now because you kids blew it. And you know, somebody has to suffer, you know, somebody has to carry the burden. And that's me as the parent. I'm the official ice cream eater of the treat if they don't earn it. Thank God. I always find a way for them not to earn it. And, uh, but, uh, but anyway, joking, uh, in all seriousness, God says, you know what? <clears throat> you guys don't deserve to go in. And your repentance is not true repentance because if they really, look, you've seen it so many times in the Bible. God is so merciful. His mercy endures forever. I think if they would have said, Moses, Go plead to God for us. We did wrong. What were we doing? Of course God can bring us in. He brought us across the Red Sea. He brought us out of Egypt. We're so sorry. 
and really repented and said, if God thinks that's best, we'll trust him. We did wrong. But all they said is, look, God promised this land, and we sinned, yeah, and we're going in. <clears throat> Maybe a little acknowledgement just, just to throw it out there so you can get what you want from God. Can I say, repentance is a state of mind, not just doing something so you can get what you want from God. It's a sorrow for who you hurt, for sinning against God. It's something not just to get out of trouble. And it's not something just to say, just to make people think uh, uh, you're sorry now. <clears throat> Repentance is real from the heart. And it's not just to get something. Ready? <coughs> True repentance. So here, let's, let's, let's put it in this situation. True repentance will say repentance when they don't get what they want. So the kid comes up and he goes and, <clears throat> and uh, he steals a candy bar. And the parents find out and take the candy bar. And you say, you're not going to get a candy bar for a week. But first they say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can I have the candy bar now? No. Well, fine, that's not fair. They weren't ever repentant. Repentance knows you deserve a punishment. <clears throat> Repentance is sorrow for what you did, not that not you got caught. Repentance is not acting sorry so you can get what you want. Repentance is humble enough to when you get punishment, you accept the punishment because you deserve it. That's what truly, that's what David did when God, when God uh, went and addressed his sin. Many people in the Bible would say, Lord, whatever is good in your sight, I, I've sinned. But many people say, I've sinned, now can you give me what I want? I'm sorry. But that's not real sorrow. Godly sorrow work with repentance. There's a real sorrow there. Okay? And, and so they, they, they just said, okay, fine. I said, okay, we're going in. We're right here. God promised us this land. We presume we're going to get this land. <laughs> no. Why would you presume, blessing, presume blessings with foolish decisions and sinful decisions? But people do that. And decide to really get right with God. He's merciful. He's kind. He can bless you and he can take you into the promised land. But you know what? You got you to understand God's been good to you and you're very accountable and, and you've insulted him very deeply. And, and don't expect him to go with you with your plans. It's your life is not, God, come and bless my plans. Your life should be, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll obey you. And then God blesses his plans and you're living out his plans. And so don't go up and fight this battle by yourself. Don't think you can do it without the Lord. Don't think, and you'll get so discouraged being defeated when you wrestle against flesh and blood with your physical abilities and your mental abilities. You need the Lord. And we need God every day. Without him, we can do nothing. And so remember that. These people thought they'd go up and phew, they got smashed quickly. It wasn't a long battle. It wasn't a big story. It was. They went over the hill to go in there and they went phew, back down the hill. That was pretty much it. And then they started their wandering because they were never going to go in. Um, because they, they were trying to go without God. The same people who wouldn't go in with God's blessing decided to go in without God's blessing because it's called rebellion. <laughs> and rebellion will rebel no matter what the situation is. So let's be careful not to fight this thing without God and not to try to do, get victory without God because we need him in this spiritual battle. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to teach your word, and I pray that we would be people, <clears throat> first of all, who are very accountable because we've been blessed so much. We've seen you bless our lives, and you've given us so many things. We're very accountable. But secondly, Lord, may we never presume upon you to bless us. May we never make plans and try to manipulate things without your blessing, by our own works. And Lord, certainly may we never try to fight this battle without you. I pray today you use this message to speak to our hearts and to uh, do great works in our lives that we would be truly repentant and decide to do, do your plan for our life and not to fight this war in the flesh. Thank you, Lord, for your word. <clears throat> I pray for great power and great blessings uh, upon the people of God that heard this message and help us to trust only in you and needs you every hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Heads about our eyes are closed.